Good evening. Is it on? Okay. Uh, you all help me open this up in prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this glorious day. We thank you and praise you in all situations and all circumstances. And, Lord, I just ask you for your strength and, uh, and ask that you wrap your loving arms around the newcomer and those that are scared to be here. And there are those that don't know why they're here, but they've, maybe they got drug here. <clears throat> we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> I am a new creation in Christ, recovering from the lifestyle of alcohol, drugs, drug dealing, pornography, sex addiction, and anger. My name is Bill. <clears throat> Man. I was born in Detroit, the youngest of, oh, I'm here to share my experience, strength, and hope with you. Hopefully you'll get something out of it, and I hope you come away uh, learning a little bit of something. Uh, I was born in Detroit, the youngest of three, to William and Eleanor Robbins. I have an older sister and an older brother. And I was a wee lad when I, moved to the, when I got moved to the suburbs, and if I, there we go, uh, <clears throat> out of the roots of Detroit. Both my parents worked. My mom was a computer programmer analyst and my father a journeyman plumber. I overdosed for the first time when I was five years old. I uh, climbed up on top of the kitchen or up on top of the refrigerator and got a hold of the St. Joseph orange flavored baby aspirins. You could say I had an addiction of more. I just really liked the way they tasted. <clears throat> I had a great childhood, as I recall, when I was growing up. Um, we went on family picnics with VFW and the American Legion. I went on hikes, uh, rode our bikes everywhere, went on scavenger hunts, went swimming, fishing, playing Tarzan, building forts, exploring in the woods, and family vacations. My dad uh, took me to uh, work with him uh, when I was young, probably eight or nine years old or so. He also took me to the VFW, the American Legion, the Elks, the Moose Lodge, and all of their functions, their pancake breakfasts and their picnics. Also got to learn how to uh, shoot pool and wash bar glasses. I learned you didn't shoot slop, and if you scratched, you uh, lost your turn. We watched Walt Disney movies on Sunday nights, Batman and the Partridge Family, Superman, My Three Sons, Andy Griffith, Bugs Bunny, The Road Runner, just a typical American family. There was a secret in my house. My dad's brain injury from a fall at work when I was around five, which the doctors said would change him. Apparently, he started drinking alcoholically at that time. So as I was growing up, he was drinking himself to death. Uh, I wasn't told about this until much later in life after he had passed away about what happened. He stopped coming home every day, though, and when he did come home, the last few years of his life, he was uh, drunk and would pass out on the couch or pass out while he was cooking things on the stove and that. Um, I developed a, a cold heart somewhere around then uh, or before that. That I, I felt that I just didn't matter to my family. Somehow they thought uh, that I did not need to be told what was going on or why it was going on. They used to spell things out, and I guess I wasn't that good at English because I couldn't figure it out. But um, I was feeling like I, I had these feelings uh, developed in of about being independent and self-sufficient, and then I was going to have to take care of my own self. Uh, and I just didn't matter to others. Or what happened to others didn't matter to me either. At the age of 12, I was given my first drug at uh, junior high. I started doing drugs on a, uh, regular, on a daily basis and was off to the races in junior high. By the time I was 13, I was dealing drugs. I was growing reefer in my attic, drinking uh, Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill and apple wine, eating mescaline and acid and many other street and pharmaceutical drugs. I've come across a lot of people who said they experimented or dabbled in drugs. Well, I was more into full-scale research. It's growing reefer under my, <clears throat> it's growing reefer under lights in my attic. I was uh, doing the isomerization process to make hash and hash oil. Uh, it's capping methoqualudes at our kitchen table, and uh, yeah, I was about 14 when my father passed away of alcoholism. He died in the Ann Arbor VA hospital of. Uh, uh, cirrhosis of the liver, hepatitis, and uh, yellow jaundice. 
by the time I was in high school, I was selling an average of five pounds of marijuana a week and any other drug I could get my hands on. I used to get around a lot by hitchhiking to do business around town. And they tell you hitchhiking is dangerous, but they don't tell you why. Well, as a result, I was seduced by hardcore pornography that someone had in their car, and I was molested. The shame, the guilt, and the remorse of that incident led me to try blocking it out and to stuff all those feelings. I did not tell anyone, my brother, my mother, girlfriend, or the police. The chain of, that, that chain of events led to other dysfunctions in my life, mainly the pornography, the sex, and intimacy in relationships. Well, what do you think? It gets better from here? <clears throat> After uh, graduating high school, I ended up selling cops to the, re or yeah, selling, selling reefer to the cops out of my mother's house, had my mother's house raided, ended up uh, getting uh, to the Detroit House of Correction for a while, and, uh, and when I got out, I moved, decided to move to Florida to change my life and to get out of the cold, miserable weather of Michigan. The ease of making money selling drugs warped my view of things and how life worked. Going, uh, going to school so mom could get social security, looking back, I was going to school to sell drugs and eager to do it because I had a captive audience of 3,000 students. Somehow I got the idea that selling drugs and working was how I was going to make it in life. Money and drugs were my God. In the move to Florida, the geographical cure, <clears throat> Moving to Fort Lauderdale in the late 70s to get away from drinking and drugging <laughs> <clears throat> just didn't quite work out how I had planned. I did good for a very short time. I uh, went to community college, and, uh, and now I noticed these guys hanging around the U Totem store. I was kind of lonely and uh, met them. And it was back to the same things, except it was a little bit different. Now it was bales, kilos, and quaaludes by the thousands, back into the same things as Michigan. Two weeks after uh, the state of Florida in the early 80s passed the forfeiture law, uh, I got very well acquainted with that. I was pulled over in my uh, Coupe de Ville and, uh, for driving left of center on a road that had recently been paved, and there was no center line. But... Uh, I happened to have nine pounds of reefer in the back, and uh, the car I had just got, so were the Firestone radials, and, uh, well, pay for the car. The nine pounds were fronted. Had to pay for those. Pay for the lawyer, the tires, the car. You know, stay out of jail. Paid my tab. I was back in business. Beginning to see a pattern? <clears throat> I was a functioning alcoholic and drug addict 24-7 for almost two and a half decades with a bad attitude of indifference and, very, and a very selfish, self-centered lifestyle. Fast forward 20 years, same things going on. But after becoming my best customer and giving away everything I had ever worked for or gotten, the house, the antiques, the El Dorado, the truck, the nine-year relationship, I reached a point in my life that I hated myself. I had hated what I'd become. I was an alcoholic drug addict that didn't know any other way to live. I was always, always worked, always had a job somehow. But uh, at that time, I cried out to my jailhouse foxhole prayer, God help me. You saw some pictures of uh, me in front of a church there or something, but as I grew up and I had some of the manger scene, when I was growing up, the only thing we went to church for was weddings and funerals. Easter, the only thing I knew about it was uh, chocolate Easter bunnies and colored eggs and jelly beans. You know, didn't even have a clue as to what it was about. Shortly after that prayer and ongoing drug counseling through probation in the judicial system, I asked the Broward County judge for a six-month drug and alcohol treatment program. She said they would call when a bed was available. I said, call? Okay. I, she didn't know I didn't have a phone. <clears throat> so naturally, I went back to doing what I knew, drinking and drugging. 
A few days later, in a drunken state of mind, I was buying drugs on the street, and uh, I was robbed and beat by four young men who, uh, but I didn't let go of the dope. A um, couple days later, I asked a friend to take me to the hospital. I ended up in the, uh, I wanted to go to the emergency room, but they thought it would be better fitting if I went to the trauma unit. And then from the trauma unit to the operating room and then to the intensive care unit for 11 days. Minus one spleen and 36 staples added up my stomach. Now they had a bed ready for me at the treatment center. My, Je my buddy Jeff came back to pick me up and to take me to the treatment center. The plan was to get some clothes and take me there. I said, hey, Jeff, stop at the store. He says, what for? He says, don't tell me you want a beer. You just got out of the hospital. I said, yeah, Jeff, but, you know, it's been 11 days. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says that alcohol is cunning, baffling, and powerful. Trust me, it is. <clears throat> In the treatment, they told me this was a simple program. You only have to change one thing. With anxious ears, I heard them say, everything, especially my thinking. It's like, what's wrong with my thinking? Anyways, my counselor used to share little things with me too. He told me my mind was like a bad neighborhood and that I shouldn't go there alone. <laughs> then my... My sponsor, I mentioned my sponsor here and there throughout this, but I got to tell you, my sponsor, I met him in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I was 36 years old when I asked Jerry to be my sponsor. And I don't know about you, but that was one of the most fearful things in my life uh, because I never asked for anybody for anything, you know, that I couldn't get myself. But here I had to ask this man to help me. I had to stick out my hand and ask him to help me. And uh, I was fearful of that. But anyways, Jerry also told us to tell me to share things like, just because I thought of it doesn't mean it's a good idea. Hmm. And then he, told, and then he added something else in there, and he said to ch always check my motives. It's like, what? I got to think about why I'm doing it too? Hmm. The six-month treatment program I was in, Bridges of America Turning Point, gave me a good foundation now. You see, after 30 days, I got a 30-day chip from Narcotics Anonymous. It was the first time since I was 12 that I had 30 days clean. I hadn't been without a drink or a drug for almost two and a half decades. You know, three weeks after I picked up that uh, chip, I uh, started looking back at my life and realizing these things. But three weeks later, a bunch of bikers showed up at the treatment center. And I didn't think much of it until I recognized Ozark um, and his wife, Rita. See, John, my buddy in the neighborhood, introduced me to him years ago. And he was a neighbor that lived in my neighborhood. And uh, I knew I could trust him because, uh, after all, I used to sell him reefer. You know? That night, he did for me, though, what no one had ever done. He shared the good news of Jesus Christ with me. That night, I ended up kneeling at a picnic table and doing the sinner's prayer, and I asked Jesus Christ into my heart. And you know what? <laughs> I haven't been the same since. <laughs> I had to confess that night to Ozark that I really didn't know how to pray. And he said that was okay. And then when I went to bed and put my boots underneath there, when I got up in the next morning, I should, you know, I got down on my knees to get my boots. I should ask God to keep me away from a drink or a drug that day. And then if I was successful at night, I should thank him. The very next week, I leveled up to uh, green dot status at the treatment center and uh, was allowed to go to outside meetings. And there was this bus that came on Friday nights. And these guys would get on there and they'd go someplace and they'd come back a few hours and I'd say, where do y'all go? You'll find out. They wouldn't tell me anything. I'm a green dot though now. I want on the bus. You know? So I got on the bus and the next thing I know is it showed up at this church over in Fort Lauderdale called Christ Church. And uh, 
Pastor Wes was there, <laughs> along with George. And uh, anyways, that was the first time I, uh, 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 I made it to celebrate recovery. And uh, at that treatment center, though, I was working 40 hours a week now. And I say I had a meeting every night of the week, either with Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous. And on Friday nights, I went to Celebrate Recovery. And two weeks after I started going to Celebrate Recovery, that same church started a Saturday night worship service in the gym. And uh, Dick used to, Dick Wills was the pastor, and he used to sit up on the stage on a bar stool, and he'd talk to us, you know. And... Uh, this is a, one of the things I got to tell you, too, is he talked about pornography one night. And he said, uh, anything you do in secret, anything you do in the dark, anything you do in secret is going to rob you of any true intimacy with another person. You know what I did that night? I went home and I threw out my pornography. And I started attending church for the first time in my life. I realized I needed to pursue my new life the same way I did my past life. I needed it all. I needed my sponsor, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, Celebrate Recovery, Church, and work for my recovery of my past lifestyle. See, I don't know about you, but I have to keep my mind out of the bad neighborhood. You know that mental masturbation, the old way of thinking? I don't know about you, but <clears throat> a song on the radio can take me back 20 years. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says we have found one that has all power. And that one is God. And may you find him now. And then in the big, big book, the Bible, the basic instruction before leaving earth, in Romans 12, 2, it says, don't be conformed by the ways of this world but be transformed by a renewal of your mind. Let me just say that if you haven't read this yet, if you don't know what's in it, do yourself a favor and pick it up and start. There's a lot of it that's really scary. And there are stories about all kinds of dysfunction. But um, there's also some wisdom and some truth, a lot of truth. And uh, it's how I start my morning every day now. And uh, I used to make excuses as to about how I didn't have time. And when I came home from work, I was tired and I didn't want to bother. And, you know, and then I was doing an Emmaus weekend, and there was a gentleman there from our church. And he got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and he got a shower, and he did his thing, and he got dressed, and, you know, and he was always in a good mood, and he always did. And then he got sat down, and he read his Bible. And every morning I read, I'm in uh, Second Kings now, and I'm uh, uh, reading, uh, I read a psalm, and I read a proverb every day. And uh, that's just my way of starting the day. But I encourage you to, if you don't have one, there's a lot of other good stuff in there, too. Uh, well, that's what I did. I was told, don't go back to the same neighborhood. Don't hang out with the same people. That's what they told me in treatment. And they said, don't do the same stupid stuff. They said, get a sponsor. Get a home group. Get a job in the home group. Get a job at Celebrate Recovery. Well, they didn't tell me to get a job at Celebrate Recovery, but I did. I took a class at church, too. I became a Stephen minister. I got involved with Alcoholics Anonymous, Celebrate Recovery. I got involved with other functions of the church. I got involved with Narcotics Anonymous. I became a caregiver with Shepherd's Way, which was a uh, uh, homeless ministry over in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I was told, though, don't just go to it. Become a part of it. Get involved with it. It's like the poker chip. One of the poker chip denotes in Alcoholics Anonymous, they give them out that we're gambling with our lives. But you notice on the poker chip, it's really rough around the outside edge, and it's nice and smooth in the middle. When you get involved with recovery, it's nice and smooth. It's rough when you just hang out on the outside. My sponsor said, read the, oh, this is the other thing about Jerry. He said, well, if, if I'm going to sponsor you, there's, there's conditions. 
conditions? What? He said, yeah. He says, you've got to go to at least one step meeting a week. I said, I'm doing that. I was going to this one over in Fort Lauderdale on Tuesday night. He said, that's a good one. That's good. He goes, he, uh, he goes get a 12 and 12. I says, I got it. He said, okay, read it. I said, okay. And he said, hey, call me every day. I said, what? Call me. I don't know about you, but I wasn't used to being accountable or honest or truthful with anybody. Uh, I was truthful. I just omitted things I didn't think they needed to know, you know. Um, but anyways, calling somebody every day was not, not, not me, but I did the best I could. And, uh, and I ended up calling him every day, and he continued to be my sponsor, and we still talk to this day. Uh, at the step meeting, though, I heard Stu say, now Stu is a very well-dressed looking guy, had a beautiful wife, spoke really eloquently. It turns out Stu was a lawyer, you know. Uh, but he also said that those that don't do the steps don't do well. And those that don't do a fourth, fourth and fifth step will drink again. I listened to what Stu had to say. Later, that same church I went to for Celebrate Recovery and uh, 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 Saturday Night Church, they started, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous started an AWOL step study group there. And they were rather strict. They kept attendance. If you were tardy twice, they marked you absent. And if you were absent three times, they kicked you out. They said, obviously, you have a, a problem with commitment. I think it's the only thing that I ever had perfect attendance to in my life. Um, and what did I get out of it? My group started out with 25 guys in it. And by within about two or three months, we were down to 12. And uh, it took a year to go through that step study. We met every Tuesday night for about two hours, and uh, we got to know each other. And the rule was is that you have a sponsor, that nobody moves on in the group until uh, uh, everybody has done that step. And, uh, and uh, we did that. And what I also got out of it was... 12 really, really, really good friends. Something that I can't honestly say I ever had in my life. Uh, I also got feelings, which is another thing. <coughs> Didn't expect, <coughs> you know. Uh, but when I worked at, when, uh, while working the fourth and fifth steps, I was released and freed from my past. Jesus truly did have a place in my heart. Something I realized while reviewing my testimony was I listened to my sponsor. See, I asked, I got to, I got to actually talk to him, you know, and, and ask, we, we carried on conversations after a while, you know. Um, but I asked him too, I said, Jerry, I said, you know, how long should it take me to do my four step? He says, oh, it's, take as long as you want. He says, you only have to answer one question. I said, really? Because this is what I'm wanting to hear because I'm, I haven't done anything yet. He assured me I could take as long as I want. <clears throat> All I had to do is, uh, figure out how long I wanted to be miserable. <laughs> Okay, all right. That night I went, uh, I went home and I wrote out my fourth step to the best of my ability. And I, when I was ready to do my fifth step, he was there. And you know what? I was scared to death. I was so full of fear because I was sure he was going to condemn me and tell me about what a scumbag I was, you know? Uh, I was scared of what he would think of me, the things that I had done that I wanted to take to my grave because I had followed my rule. I didn't get caught. But now I had to confess. And you know what? He did not judge, guilt, or shame me, but rather pointed out that I wasn't in a sober state of mind for so much of the time. And if there was a name for it, it had already been done. I was not so unique that I had created some new sin, and that Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood so that I could be forgiven and reborn again to start a new life without pain, regret, 
guilt, and shame. The funny thing I realized was that even though I was forgiven by Jesus Christ when I was baptized by the church, see that same church that I started going on Saturday night, after about six or so months or so, Debbie used to always ask, anybody want to join a church? And I joined a church, and then she says, have you ever been baptized? And I says, no. I said, that was actually a conversation I had with my mother. She said, no, we baptized your brother and your sister, but we never got around to you. And she goes, well, you want to get baptized? And I says, all right. And she got all excited. And I was like, wait, wait, slow, slow down, slow down. What is baptism? She goes, you're forgiven of all your sins. And I said, well, cool. I, uh, yeah, I, I can handle that. You know, that's good. But I did not feel forgiven or relieved of all my sins until I did my fist step. For in James 5, 16, it says, confess your sins to one another so that you can pray for one another so that you may be healed. And the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. When I did my fifth step with my sponsor, I felt a new freedom and a new release. I, you know, those things that I was going to take to my grave, those things that I didn't want anybody else to ever know, you know, weren't holding me down. I wasn't chained to that anymore. They say go to 90 meetings in 90 <clears throat> excuse me. They say go to 90 meetings in 90 days. You want to be bold? Do 180 in 90 days. Get a sponsor. Work the steps. Don't leave before the miracle happens. If you came to just stop drinking, doing drugs, being codependent, to get a from overeating, from food, from emotional, whatever it is, don't cut yourself short. The program of recovery has so much more to offer in helping us peel the onion to find out who we truly are and who God made us to be. I truly believe that the 12 steps help us become the men and women that God intended us to be, not the ones the world, we, world wants us to conform to. Since being in recovery, I've managed to get involved, gotten involved in a few other things. I first joined Christ Church, and then I became a Stephen minister. My sponsor got me involved in uh, service work in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't really like writing much, but my first job was assistant to the secretary. And then I became the secretary. And then I thought I was going to get out of coffee because I said, you know, I would do it, but, you know, I ride a bike, you know, so I can't do the coffee because we made a big jug full. And they said, that's all right, we'll give you a ride, you know. <laughs> then I got involved with Intergroup District. Uh, I actually did a play in Alcoholics Anonymous that uh, we ended up doing at the state convention. We did it for a district meeting, and it got rave reviews. And then I was liaison. I was on the corrections committee. I was an alternate GSR, general service representative. I was a general service representative. I was a small group leader at Celebrate Recovery, a caregiver at Shepherd's Way, a homeless ministry, and forth. Then I joined Grace Church after moving across the state and was recruited to help start Celebrate Recovery. Went on the walk, uh, went on the walk to the Emmaus, got married to my lovely wife, Robin. Uh, eventually got, became self-employed and got incorporated. Worked on several Kairos prison ministries and Emmaus weekends. Went on Celebrate Recovery Summits at Saddleback Church. Served on the Celebrate Recovery ministry team. Did workshops at Grace to start Celebrate Recovery at other churches. Led book studies and step studies. Angel Tree Ministries, uh, which is part of it too. Mission trips to Paraguay uh, five times or so twice to Honduras, and God willing, I'll be going back to Paraguay again in July. Um, since uh, getting uh, sober, um, I've been exonerated by the Florida Department of Children and Families. I became a foster parent, which I guess is kind of, you know, being a convicted felon, uh, you know. I have a folder now, it's about this thick, except it's with recommendations of who I am. I mean... Who would have thought? Uh, uh, 
My, uh, me and my wife had the privilege of, uh, uh, actually, she's, she got called up by one of our foster kids. They still stay in contact, this Facebook stuff and whatever. Uh, but we went out to uh, dinner with her the other night at Perkins, and she's a little stressed because now our, who was a 13-year-old foster kid, is now a mom and has three of her own children. And, uh, but she still likes to confide in my wife. Uh, and I, now not only did I become a foster parent, now I've also become an adoptive father of three of the most beautiful kids, which you saw out there. <laughs> You know, they give me a whole new reason for living and wanting to. Uh, if you would have asked me before what I thought my future might hold, I would have told you that I expected to be dead by the age of 40 or indicted uh, for the things that I did. Uh, that's not the case. I just celebrated my 58th uh, birthday uh, last month, and uh, who knows? I've outlived my father. And, uh, you know, so things are good. Boy, oh boy, God is good. What's he, <laughs> what's he have in store for you? You know, we don't know. Uh, Jen had mentioned something earlier about if you've come for the first, second, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, or ninth, tenth, you know. I had to get out my phone, play with my calculator a little bit. I've been coming to celebrate recovery in rough estimate, you know, about 1,100 times so far. Uh, Friday night, church, who would have thought, you know? Jesus loves you, and so do I. Thanks for letting me share. <laughs>